Okay, we're live. That's what it is. It's Monday and we're live and we're ready for another great day here on ThinkTech. We have so much to talk about, so much to explore. You know, the, the world is our oyster and we have, we have an attitude thing where we want to know everything inside the oyster. Got it? That's what we do at ThinkTech. There's no exemptions, no exclusions, no exceptions. We want it all. Hi, Marco. That's Marco Mangelsdorf. He joins us by Skype audio from Hilo. Jay, being live with you makes me feel more alive than you could possibly imagine. So once again, <laughs> thank you so much for having me on. You're a regular part of the fabric, Marco. We want you every two weeks for sure, if not more frequently than that. There's so much to talk about in energy, you know, and, uh, and actually, if we don't talk about it, then, you know, we, 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 we don't feel it. So to talk about is to feel it, and to feel it is to do it. So let's well, talk, about, talk so about... When you talk about me being part of the fabric, Jay, that's all well and good, but please don't take any of that stain remover to me, okay? <laughs> <laughs> no, and part of the fabric is a good thing. <laughs> stain remover we don't need. <laughs> Okay, we had about half a dozen things on the agenda here, and uh, we never decided exactly what to call this. I guess we could call it, uh, uh, mm, let's see, uh, Energy Post-Energy Day, because that was last Thursday. So we're sort of taking a look at things, you know, in, in the lee, in the lee uh, of Energy Day. And we'll talk about that, among other things. But first, let's talk, you just got back. You just got back within the last day or two from San Francisco when you went to the Intersolar Conference. And I really would like to know what happened and who was there and what was discussed and what you took away from it. Well, it's always great to, to go to, uh, to those gigs to see people that you haven't seen for a while. And I've been going to that particular show pretty much steadily for the past 10 years or so. It's at the Moscone Center, downtown San Francisco, which is one of my all-time favorite cities to begin with. I grew up in the, the South Bay Area and San Francisco is always very near and dear to my heart so more substantively it's always interesting to see who shows up and who decides to pay booth money uh, for putting together their their displays there and to to peddle their wares and kind of who's there and who's not there and I can uh, share with you kind of my general observations is that the Chinese are back the Chinese uh, in terms of uh, module manufacturing and other equipment related to solar electric uh, they are back they went through several years of kind of being uh, no shows after uh, the difficulties that the chinese pv industry and one company in particular suntech power uh, suffered so they are back and the other uh, most noteworthy thing I, I would say is that the uh, the buzz for this particular conference was on the b word you know what the b word is right mm. batteries keep going batteries Ah, uh, battery store. word, okay. Yeah, that yeah. would be another the, the, the word big, for battery when you have it in the context of solar energy. Anyway, yes, go ahead. Big buzz in California as well as Hawaii in terms of battery storage, and I think it's under so-called uh, Rule 21 and under the California PUC that there is a big push on the part of the, the Brown administration, Jerry Brown administration, and the PUC there to bring on board uh, utility scale battery storage uh, sooner rather than later so there, there's a lot of buzz about batteries uh, both on both sides of the meter on the utility side of the meter uh, which would be at power plants and substations and also on the customer side of the meter which would be they're sited directly uh, at uh, someone's home or business so batteries 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 that was kind of the buzz anything new um, in but, batteries 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 uh, I mean, there are a number of uh, newer technologies out there, uh, but, uh, I mean, it, it's still, there's no kind of magic bullet as far as I'm concerned, as far as batteries, uh, as far as the be-all and end-all that's going to uh, dramatically reshape the, the terrain, at least in the near term. I mean, it, Elon Musk and his gigawatt battery factory yeah, sure. uh, is, uh, is, taking shape i mean the construction has started in there in the desert of uh of nevada so uh, when that comes online i mean if it's uh, if it's putting out this type of product at the volume and pricing as people believe then that's going to be uh, could be a very big deal so you know, but we're a little bit a ways away from that but you know he's he's clearly pushing his chips to the center of the table bettering bet, betting on uh, 
battery technologies being a very important part of uh, solving the energy puzzle in terms of the non-firm power sources like wind and solar. You know, I always said, and this is going years back, I always said that the guy who figured out a better battery would make Bill Gates look like a piker. Um, and um, I think uh, Musk must have had the same idea. It raises a couple of questions, though. One question came up in Energy, Energy Day, <clears throat> which I'd like to pose to you and see what you think. Where do batteries best fit? Do they, do they best fit, you know, at the residence, at, at, at the solar installation, the rooftop solar installation? Do they best fit, you know, in a, a kind of regional power center, you know, a, a sort of, a, you know, in, in the middle between the residence and, and the, you know, the, the utility big generation equipment? Or do they fit at the big generation equipment? Three possibilities. Um, I guess the fourth possibility is all of the above. What, what's your thought about that? Where are they best deployed? I think I would go with all of the above, Jay. I'm, I'm certainly would never pass myself off as some type of uh, expert when it comes to the best strategy for battery energy storage deployment across the grid. But it, it, intuitively, it makes a lot of sense to me that it's going to be both on the small scale level in terms of people having a energy storage at their home and, and small businesses to be, especially here in our state, to be able to store solar power during uh, low demand hours in our state, which is typically between, let's say, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., and be able to provide that power to the utility companies when they need it the most, which is between roughly 5 to 9 p.m. So one can certainly make the case that it makes sense to have some site storage uh, be promulgated and expanded on a substantial level, and then also have it uh, on the utility side of the meter at, like I said earlier, substations and power plants that uh, will allow them to uh, meet some of their needs and concerns uh, with all the, uh, the continuing and growing amount of, uh, of uh, distributed generation rooftop solar. So I think it's, uh, I, I agree with the all of the above. You know, that, and, and that, your, your comment leads to another, another thing I wanted to ask your uh, opinion on. And that is, uh, you know, if we assume for a minute that battery improvements are sort of incremental, and you know, there's no, there's no, um, you know, great drama coming in battery technology. Not in the next few years, anyway. I mean, there's so many people out there that like to make Bill Gates look like a piker. Uh, you know, fact is, there's no great new technology. It, it comes in little steps. Um, sort of, it's sort of like the solar panels. It's the same thing. You know, because there are a lot of people working on it, but there's no drama. But what, what does occur to me, is that like solar panels. It's the connecting software. It's the software that uses the power in the battery, that, that draws down from the battery, uh, that figures out when and how and where uh, you, know, you use the battery or you charge the battery. And we haven't even started really in, you know, in, in developing the, the level of sophisticated software that we will ultimately have. And so it's a, it's a call to the young programmers it's a call to programmers everywhere. Um, this is really the area, and uh, it's only software. It's not, you know, chemistry like the battery, or for that matter, chemistry like the solar panel. But you know, you can get to be a, Gil a Bill Gates and more if you develop software that will make better use of these other structures. What do you think? Well, what you I think are referring to, whether you are aware of it or not, Jay, is uh, that. Uh, phrase that I have some difficulty with because it means a lot of things to a lot of people, also known as the smart grid, because, <laughs> because that's what will very much be needed uh, along with storage will be the electronics to be able to determine energy flow. I mean, traditionally from the beginning of electrification across the, the country and, and, and around the world, I mean, the model going back to Edison days is uh, central power generation as a hub and then you have spokes of transmission distribution providing it to people far and wide and we are moving to that post edisonian uh, model uh, how long it's going to take how fast it's going to work uh, you know remains to be seen but a uh, one in which you have distributed generation which is really a, i think a very descriptive uh, 
way of, of understanding going from central power plants to having um, almost countless or at least many, many, many small power plants uh, on people's homes and people's businesses. And you need to have the brains, the electronics, the logic to be able to manage power flow, not just in one traditional direction, which is the way it has been, but in, in back and forth and round and round and so forth. So there had to be a fair amount of, uh, of booths and discussion um, at the Intersolar Conference in San Francisco about this, yes? I mean, this must be uh, an important element in, in, um, you know, in that conference and any conference having to do with renewable energy, no? Well, I didn't get a chance to attend nearly as, uh, as many sessions as I would have liked, and that's kind of the, one of the drawbacks, I guess, is two days of just uh, really packed activity where on one particular day I had meetings or meals essentially from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. in terms of seeing people I needed to see and that didn't give me the chance to attend sessions as I would have liked to. I did give uh, a presentation on one panel where I was uh, essentially telling people, uh, my opening line was, I, 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 I'm here bringing you news from the future. Because, <laughs> because, because in Hawaii we are, we're no longer, I mean, the, the so-called postcard from the future, I mean, we are living in the future, and what I mean by that is that grid penetration of distributed generation resources in the form of rooftop, rooftop PV has now reached the point on the island of Molokai where Maui Electric has, for all intents and purposes, since January, not approved any more rooftop PV. In other words, the door is closed on that island. And how much further, how much longer do we have on the other islands, Oahu? Uh, Maui proper, Lanai, the big island, Kauai, from the state that Molokai is in right now. So that's what I wanted to impress upon people, at least in my, my uh, 20, 25-minute well, presentation. Well, it's a moment for catch-up, though, isn't it? I mean, if I, if I gave you uh, a lot of good batteries, if I gave you a lot of good software, um, if, I, if I was able to store the excess generated during the day from all these solar installations, uh, then you'd you'd uh, you'd open the floodgates again, right? Um, we could go to 100% on solar if we had batteries that would handle it overnight, right? I don't know for a fact that we could go to 100%, but I, I I can say I think with a high degree of confidence that with storage on both sides of the meter, the utility company could go. Uh, significantly higher in terms of uh, distributed generation rooftop solar than they are uh, now. Yeah, yeah, and that's so. You know, uh, I mean, it's to me these limits are uh, they're temporary, waiting on technology. Uh, and and meanwhile, we we got to take a break and we got to wait on the rest of this discussion. And the rest of this discussion is going to include at least in the beginning the uh, some some reference to Energy Day, which happened in your absence while you were in San Francisco, and I'd like to tell you a little about that. But for the moment, let's take a little break, and we'll come right back. Marco Mangelsdorf, ProVision Solar in Hilo by Skype. Aloha. My name is Jim Sean, and I'm host of a show called Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. Each week, live streaming at noon on Think Tech Hawaii, we interview people who have special insights into education from early education through K-12, all the way through higher education and beyond. Both public and private are areas we're interested in. We dig deeper. We try to find out uh, what it's really like to be involved in making change, advocating for it, how you reform, what people's philosophies are in reforming it. Uh, as I said, we're live streaming every Wednesday at noon on Think Tech Hawaii. And later on, you can find these interviews on YouTube and on the Hawaii Educational Policy Center website. We hope you join us as many times as possible. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're going to spend a minute talking about Energy Day. That's the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum's annual Energy Day, which was last Thursday, July 16th at Laniakea. And there were really uh, two parts to it. One was Transformational Achievement Awards, 
where the uh, forum gave uh, awards to uh, half a dozen people and uh, make that five. Uh, and, and the governor, Governor Ige, uh, made some comments about that, about the state of energy in Hawaii, and he helped present the awards. I don't know if I can remember all five of them, but uh, one of them was uh, <clears throat> Hitachi for the smart grid work uh, in Maui, uh, and that was interesting. Another was uh, Solar City for having uh, entered into some collaborative prob problem solving with Hawaiian Electric uh, to increase the amount of solar on the grid. Uh, that was a, a sort of a, a transformational achievement in collaboration. Uh, the Navy got one for wave energy in Kaneohe. That was interesting. Uh, Mike Gabbard just uh, recently uh, uh, stepped down as chair of the Energy Committee. He was there to talk to receive an award for his past service. Uh, and um, of course, uh, Chris Lee, the current chair of the Energy Committee in the House, <clears throat> was al also got an award. And let me think if I can. Oh, and a, a, a woman named Helen Y, who gives uh, who gives efficiency lectures around the state and uh, tells people who don't know anything about energy how it works and how they can be more efficient. I know I missed one in there somewhere, but there were five of them, and it was a really good idea to give awards, uh, and uh, they were well presented, well received, uh, and they were appropriate. And actually, it's a sign of, sign of a trend, I think, that we'll, you'll see more as we go forward, that is to give awards to people in energy who are actually making some kind of transformational uh, contribution to it. Um, sort of, it's a metric of sorts. And it was, that was one half of the program. The other half were three panels. And the three panels, uh, one ha had to do with the utility of the future. It was uh, really all about, uh, you know, where Hawaiian Electric was going, uh, with or without um, uh, Next Era. And that was chaired by Hermina Morita, the, uh, the, you know, the, the recent uh, chair of the PUC, and Alan Oshima, uh, the uh, current CEO of uh, Hawaiian Electric, Robert Harris, who like um, has all kinds of business models to the contrary, wants to change everything around. He used to be a Sierra Club, and he's definitely a solar activist. And Kyle Dada, Kyle uh, is with Ulupono uh, Foundation and the Ulupono Initiative, uh, and he and he was the integrator person who tried to identify options. It was very interesting in the sense that. Uh, the, the organizers of Energy Day propounded questions to the audience. The audience was statewide on Live SIFT, now called Meeting SIFT, um, and they responded. So we had voting. We had feedback, actual real-time feedback from people, um, you know, on what the utility of the future uh, ought to be like. And uh, that, that, was, that really made it um, very vital. Then we had two more panels, one on the, uh, I guess, on the smart grid. Um, chaired by Don Lippert of the uh, Energy Accelerator, and David Bissell, my hero, uh, the guy who runs uh, KIUC, he's the CEO of KIUC, the Kauai Island Utility Co-op. He gave great, great uh, speech. His, his basic point was, what are you guys talking about, you know, re reorganizing uh, everything, you know, we have billions into a, uh, into a grid, why would you throw that away? Uh, Chris DeBone represented the Solar Association, I guess that's the Hawaii Solar Energy Association, and, and Ben Sullivan, also from Kauai. Um, so that was also interesting, and they also had feedback at the end. Finally, the third one had to do with LNG, uh, and uh, Dwayne Shimagawa of Pacific Business News was the moderator, Ron Cox, uh, who is a retired Navy captain and engineer, and uh, he, was, he represented uh, Hawaiian Electric, the pro side of LNG, if you will. Jeff Michelina represented the um, not so pro side of LNG, and Murray Clay was the integrator trying to look at analysis and options. That was also very interesting. And it was, was interesting that in the feedback, there were a fair number of people felt that we ought to have LNG as a bridge fuel. So uh, this was a surprise in many ways to see the feedback you know, come through. And I think it actually sets a new standard, Marco, on, on how you do these kinds of conferences how you go out there and draw people in to do Q&A, but also to express views on pre-written questions and get an idea of what the public really thinks. So often, you know, activists will tell you what the public thinks or try to make you think they represent the public, but they don't. Uh, right. In this way, with this kind of, you know, broad-based survey technique, 
uh, you, you actually might get a, an idea about what people out there think. Thoughts? What have you heard? Well, I was going to ask you, Jay, what kind of your principal one or two takeaways were from all this, uh, all these interesting and committed people and all this interesting and fascinating information. What kind of, what, what, what were you left with? I, I was left with, um, you know, I always feel that every time you do one of these energy thing programs, you're really trying to identify the chapter that we're really in. Because, uh, you know, you could easily make the conclusion that every year is a new chapter. The way things move, they move so fast. And, and I would say that uh, I think the remarks of Alan Oshima, you know, were, were very important. He said, well, you, you know, stop beating up on Hawaiian Electric, will you? Let's, let's work together. And we're trying. And you have to, you know, give us the respect of that and, and, and stop with all the nasty. And, and I thought that was really right on. Um, and, and I carried that away from that first one. Um, the second one, on, um, I guess, on um, um, the, uh, the, the, the smart grid, uh, it's coming. Um, and some, some hero, don't know who, maybe, maybe KIUC for that matter, uh, is going to be able to show us how it really works. Um, and, you know, I, the, the technology is out there, but some hero has got to get out there and say, look, um, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to integrate it. And I think that's close. That's not far away. Uh, Hitachi or no Hitachi, I mean, it's out there. Um, and finally, uh, on, on LNG, uh, however we got to where we are, uh, whether it was um, you know, a, 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 an accurate public relations campaign or not, the fact is that these days, um, most people uh, have no objection to it. I mean, a good number of people are OK with LNG. And if you, if, you, if you judge by what happened at the conference and the feedback, um, all of a sudden LNG has a greater, a greater possibility to me. Uh, and that was a takeaway also. On this kind of conference, this kind of interaction, very valuable. Um, one thing is clear, and Sharon Moriwaki, who arranged a lot of this, uh, made it clear, is that it's ultimately the people. And you, you can't make, um, you know, these political or technical decisions without educating them and without getting their opinion. And, this, and that's the way things work in Hawaii. So, you know, don't, you don't make political decisions until you consult your constituency. And I think going forward, there will probably be a greater consultation, consultation with the constituency. That's probably the biggest point I get out of it. And I, I only hope the constituency is ready for that. But I would like to see that, and I think that's a better way forward. Well, I mean, that great and wise philosopher Barbara Streisand once sang with great heart. I mean, people who need people are the luckiest people in Hawaii. <laughs> and this was not rehearsed. <laughs> and don't worry, I will not break out into song. That would be too embarrassing, Please, and I don't want to scare viewers away. Do I hear the sound of uh, feet dancing over there? <laughs> Oh, and no, I'm real, I'm real glad Alan uh, made a pitch for, for greater cooperation and less bashing because I'm, I'm candidly, I'm rather dismayed at the degree of the bashing that has been taking place uh, uh, as of late, uh, past weeks and past months, and I just see that as counterproductive to going where we all need to go. Yeah, I mean, I, he, was, he was my hero on this. Uh, he, he was very direct on it. And I thought his comments were, you know, were the right thing, and I'd like to hear more of that so that it doesn't run away, you know, with the, the side of sort of the negativity. Um, you know, it's so easy to be negative. Uh, it's so much more productive, however, to work together. Uh, and I, th I thought the same thing of David Bissell uh, in the second panel. And I guess my hero on the third panel um, would have been Ron Cox or maybe Murray Clay. Um, they were they were very good, and um, they were you know willing to engage in some very high level analysis, uh, which I appreciated, and I think people out there do appreciate it. I think we have to give them credit uh, for uh, at least being in a position to understand what's happening. You know, when we started this out in 2008, you know, the Clean Energy Initiative, um, people were really ignorant, and, and the only the only conclusion they could make is a or nay. You know, do we like clean energy or not? Uh, was not sophisticated. And, and for years, actually, I don't think the public has been sophisticated. They've been beset by, by a lot of, um, you know, shrill voices 
Uh, but now I think it's time for the public to step up and learn about this and actually participated in, on, a, on a, fair, uh, a fair basis. And I think that that's, if you ask me, you know, what I took away, that's my hope is, is that. That's what I took away. Yeah. Well, and kind of along those lines, I'll share with you that one of the observations from uh, my friend Eric Gleason at NextEra a number of months ago uh, uh, was that he was uh, surprised, a little bit surprised, and, and, uh, and uh, pleased and uh, noted that uh, the, the level of interest that the residents of Hawaii have in energy is, is I won't, maybe it's not off the charts, but it is very high, comparatively speaking, to a lot of communities, states, and folks on the mainland. In, in other words, it's much more kind of top of mind awareness here, so uh, that's which I think is a good thing because I mean energy is such a uh, vital part of our economy. I mean it, it is anywhere, but especially in in our isolated state where we're paying some of the highest energy costs, uh, at least for, as far as Americans go. So uh, that's a good thing. What you're doing and all efforts to increase the dialogue, increase public awareness, so that there's greater input. Uh, uh, into the process, into the goals and the strategies, I, I, I see is nothing but a good thing. Oh, thank you, thank you, Mark, Marco. Uh, let's take another break. When we come back, I want to talk about your op-ed piece. You and Mina Morita, who was one of our uh, uh, panel moderators last Thursday, uh, you wrote an op-ed piece which appeared in the Star Advertiser a few days ago. And uh, I would like to uh, touch on that in this discussion. So we'll take a short break. We'll be right back with Marco Mangelsdorf, who joins us by Skype uh, from Hilo. We can take a short break now, you'll see. I swear we are. Watch this. Aloha, my name is Josh Green. I'm a senator from the Big Island. I work in the ER there. But on Tuesday afternoons, I get to come and spend 45 minutes to an hour with Jay Fidel and the Think Tech staff. They're terrific professionals. They help us to bring some of the leading cutting edge topics here across our state to you. So you can join us at our show on healthcare in Hawaii to talk with leaders from across all the spectrum of health in our state or you can join us for any other show where we talk about economic development or tourism or some really eclectic programs too. So really, we'd love to see you here on our show. Thanks for joining us and thanks for supporting us. This is Alice Lee Hagen, host of Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. My show here at Think Tech Hawaii is every Thursday from 3 to 4 in the afternoon. I bring in interesting guests from Hawaii the mainland, and hopefully international guests in the future. Do join us on Thursday from 3 to 4 p.m. Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. Aloha. <laughs> okay, we're back. We're, li we're live, Marco and me, uh, here talking about post-Energy Day events in solar uh, and in energy in general. So uh, let's, let's go on to your op-ed piece. I saw that. That was very good. That was all about the end of, of net energy metering. So what were you trying to tell people in that op-ed piece, Marco? Well, first I just wanted to say it was a real pleasure for me to be able to work with uh, Mina Marita on this. Uh, she and I uh, are often on the same page in terms of our analysis of kind of what's going on energy-wise in the state and what needs to be done. So it was a real pleasure for me to be able to collaborate with Mina on this op-ed piece. And essentially, you know, I... I kind of see it as, uh, you know, in, in American politics, uh, the so-called third rail that politicians typically don't want to touch is Social Security, modifications to Social Security, because uh, the older generations are, are, are much higher in terms of voter participation than the younger ones. So older folks vote more than the younger generations do. So you, you as a politician or even an executive, a governor or in this case a president, you know, you touch Social Security at your own peril. It, you can get electrified, the third rail. And I see that kind of that analogy really uh, being similar to what uh, daring to discuss anything having to do with the subsidies that uh, the solar industry gets here in the state of Hawaii. 
and two big subsidies that we've been getting for uh, 14 years now uh, is number one is net energy metering, which has been around since July of 20, uh, 2001. And I know something about that because my company actually installed the very first NEM system in August of 2001 here on the Big Island. And then, of course, there's the solar tax credits, which we've spoken about before, which is uh, over these past several years, been averaging uh, 100 plus million dollars per year. So these are subsidies. These are subsidies that accrue to a narrow band of the rate payers or narrow band of, of taxpayers, and they are effectively being paid for by the majority of rate payers in, in the case of them, or the majority of taxpayers in the case of the tax credits. So. I'm taking uh, a rather heretical view uh, that this, the, the subsidies deserve uh, honest and candid discussions as to whether they are still justified in their cur at their current levels. And essentially, Mina and I were making the argument that NEM has been fantastically successful, and I've benefited from that. There's no doubt about that. And, and tens of thousands are pushing 70,000 homeowners in the state of Hawaii have net energy meter systems according to the recent data from Hawaiian Electric. I mean, it's been a fantastically successful program. So the obvious retort to that is, well, why, why tinker with it? Why mess with something that's been so successful? My argument and, and Mina's argument is that the conditions that required NEM back in 2001 are no longer, no longer present in 2015 in terms of the industry, the solar industry, does not need net energy metering to be cost effective. It doesn't need it as the boost, as the leg up, as we needed 14 years ago. So we essentially made the case for let's move to the post-NEM world sooner rather than later. And there's a lot of discussion taking place right now uh, under the Distributed Energy Resources, or DER, the DER docket before the PUC, where HECO has proposed uh, one path and then... Uh, the solar advocacy groups have proposed another path. The, pu the Public Utilities Commission wanted the parties on the docket to be able to come to a consensus, which of course makes sense, but they weren't able to do so. So there is now going to be continued discussions and debates over what the post-NEM world will look, at, uh, will look like. So I think it's a foregone conclusion, Jay, that NEM is on the way out. The question is what comes post-NEM? So that was... Uh, my attempt and Mina's attempt to just kind of bring this particular issue, this this debate to the forefront, and say, you know, we need to we need to move to to post them. Yeah, uh, two thoughts about that. Number one is uh, I don't know if I told you, but I'm moderating a panel on DER at the APCES, the Asia Pacific. Um, Energy Conference, the summit. And I will have the pleasure, I will have the pleasure on once again being in your beatific physical presence to be on that panel. I, I, I can't tell you, I'm counting Are the hours. Are you on that panel? I am. <laughs> oh, I didn't know. That's <laughs> fantastic. Okay. The other, the other thing that comes to mind is when you say, you and Mina Marita say you, you want to end NEM, uh, net energy metering, uh, you don't really mean you want to end the whole enchilada. You, I think what you're saying is you want to end it as it exists today and uh, change the economics of it uh, so that it's more fair to, you know, the, the people involved in the equation on all sides of the equation, right? That is correct. That is correct. I'm not by any means arguing for a, a, new, uh, a new day, a new regime where... Uh, homeowners and business owners would have no ability to connect to the grid and receive value for their solar power. I'm certainly not arguing that. I'm, uh, we're arguing for a more fair, more equitable, more reasonable uh, tariff uh, that would still be beneficial to homeowners and, and business owners who'd be getting a 100 kilowatt or smaller system, but would not be as lucrative as NEM is now. Yeah, okay. I mean, so, so, and there's two variables in that. Uh, one is uh, how much you pay for the basic connection fee, which is now, I don't know, 17 cents or something. And the other is how much does, uh, does the utility pay you for the energy you are transfer transferring back, you know, your right. excess solar energy. And right. uh, what's, what I find interesting is that in the PUC's um, parsing of all the issues in this particular docket, they're not going to they're not going to consider those two variables together. 
uh, they're gonna, apparently going to consider the, uh, the repurchase uh, number, repurchase price first, and then they're going to consider the, the uh, connection fee second. Uh, right. That surprises me because I would have thought that you looked at all the economic terms together at the same time and see how they affect each other. Thoughts? Well, I mean, Randy Iwase, the, uh, the chair of the commission, I think he, uh, I don't remember exactly what day he was quoted saying this was a number of months ago, but I, I think he, he made pretty explicit that moving to post-NEM is something that they feel is important, that the commission feels is important. But uh, the, you know, the, details, the details remain to be seen as the, as the, as the uh, participants on the DER docket don't see eye to eye. And uh, what's going to be the end result, I don't know. And I'll share with you just kind of perhaps repeat myself in terms of one of the ironies being is that Hawaiian Electric uh, filed on January 20th to uh, bring them to a close and transition to a new tariff. And they asked the PUC to essentially decide within 60 days, which the PUC declined to uh, to do. And the very act of of Hawaiian Electric trying to bring them to a close uh, got them the exact uh, unintended consequence, uh, an undesired consequence of causing a massive, massive spike across their service territories and people wanting to get them. So here they're trying to ramp the program down, and the the very act of trying to ramp the program down increases uh, increases the amount of folks by multifold who wanted to get in before the door closes. Yeah, justice de de delayed is justice denied, but then it has other consequences too. While we're on the PUC and Randy Iwasi, um, I understand that um, there's this today, today being the 20th of July is a big day as far as the approval, pro approval proceedings for the next era uh, deal. Um, is happening right now. What's 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 the deadline today, Marco? So today is the day, the deadline day for the interveners on the uh, merger docket, the proposed merger between uh, Next Year Energy out of Florida and Hawaiian Electric Industries. Uh, we lost one of the interveners over the past week or so, uh, Paniolo Power. I saw that. Uh, Yesterday, Paniolo paper. Power decided to to drop out. They decided to focus more specifically on. Uh, on uh, what what they're most interested in, which is microgrid stuff. What does that tell supply. us? They were spending too much money for lawyers, or what? Or is that a, sub well, a statement of substantive uh, change of decision? Well, I'm not privy to to, <laughs> to whether it was a resource issue or whether. Uh, uh, I mean, I, uh, by implication, I think it's a reasonable observation that they only had so much uh, uh, that they could focus on, and they were focusing more specifically on. Uh, the power supply improvement uh, plan that's also a, a very important uh, docket that's open now and and pursuing some type of microgrid options for for Parker Ranch and uh, and and what Peniola is doing there so we're down to 28 interveners and today is the deadline for all the interveners to offer testimony to the commission as far as uh, kind of what I see as a uh, preliminary or initial statement of position, not the final statement of position, but preliminary statement of position of where the interveners uh, sit or stand or do the, the Watusi or the Mambo uh, <laughs> on whether they're, they're neutral or they're supported or they're hostile or they are proposing one or more alternatives. So uh, that doc, those documents should be posted uh, by either tomorrow or Wednesday on the, uh, the PUC website, so they will become part of the public record. And then after that, the applicants, HEI next year, the applicants will be able to pose um, information requests or IRs to the interveners as they so choose. So uh, and, and up until now, the IRs have been flowing to the tune of... Uh, Gosh, I don't know how many we're up to now. Thousands and thousands of IRs, uh, all aimed at HEI next year, and now it's the chance of ne HEI next year to be able to uh, fire back, so to speak, with IRs of their own, uh, aimed at the interveners that they so choose to ask uh, pose IRs to. So it'll be very interesting to see kind of the rundown as far as, as I mentioned, uh, uh, how many uh, are coming out in favor, how many are neutral, how many are opposed, and then uh, how many are proposing uh, possible alternatives. Yeah, up till so now they haven't, they haven't been required to state a position, pro, con, or anything else. And, and, and today uh, we're going to hear from them. They'll be really, really, I'm sure the newspaper will be full of this tomorrow. 
But but what about you? You ha you're going to file something, aren't you? Can you give us a preliminary? Sure. Uh, we uh, submitted our testimony on Friday to the PUC. So that's I don't know if it's posted yet, but if not, it will be soon. And they essentially we did two things in our testimony. And actually, it's not when I say our testimony, it has to, has to be from a specific individual. So in the case of HIEC's testimony, it, it's coming from me, Marco Mangelsdorf's testimony mm -hmm. on behalf of HIEC. And uh, I said two things, essentially, two main messages. One reiterated the reasons why we got involved in the stock up to begin with in terms of our February motion to intervene, reiterated those points. And second, we are essentially asking the commission for guidance as to whether we should continue to develop uh, analyses uh, to explore the possibility of what we feel to be a possible superior alternative to the merger for specifically the 194,000 residents of this island, specifically for the residents of the Big Island, asking the commission whether essentially opening the door for them and giving them the chance to say yay or nay or maybe as far as encouraging us or, or wanting us, allowing us to explore the alternative of uh, the co-op model for the Big Island of, of Hawaii. So we're proposing, we're, we're still maintaining neutrality on uh, yay or nay on the merger itself, but we are asking the commission to give us guidance as to whether they are going to entertain the possibility of alternatives uh, in a more generic sense, but specifically the alternative of a co-op here on the Big Island. Yeah. You're not going to hear from them on that anytime soon, though. That, that's Who knows when they'll actually respond to that. Eh? I don't know. I mean, the, the ways of the commission are often a mystery to me, but uh, I, I know those three individuals got a lot on their plates and trying to grind through a tremendous amount of really, really critical uh, decisions to be made, and, and, and this is certainly one of them, or the biggest one perhaps, as far as the, the future of the state uh, and, and energy, the energy infrastructure of the state uh, on this, this particular merger. Okay, well, let's, let's go to the last point of our discussion. We only have a minute left. And that is uh, something certainly worth discussing in terms of getting a handle on where renewable energy is going in this country. And that is the deal, the national deal on Vivint, uh, which is uh, what, a big uh, solar company and they were acquired by Sun Edison for $2.2 billion. Um, wh what happened and what does this tell us, Marco? Well, it's definitely the interesting news of the day. I mean, Vivint, Solar is one of the major players in, in our state. They have been for a number of years. They are uh, focused on the residential market. They provide essentially third-party owned systems to homeowners, which means that the homeowner doesn't pay for the system per se, the photovoltaic system, but agrees to a long-term contract with the provider, and the provider gets the tax credits, depreciation. They pay for the system. It's and a financing arrangement, but, but it's been very successful, yeah? Uh, well, I mean, it, uh, the, the, the number of uh, homeowners who have gone that route here in the state has uh, taken off dramatically in the past several years. So it's been a very successful model in the state, and it's not just Vivint Solar, but also uh, Sunrun, Solar City, Sonova, SunPower, Clean Power Finance. A whole bunch of them are active in, in Hawaii. So the purchase of uh, Vivint Solar from the Blackstone Group, who purchased it, who purchased the Vivint Group several years ago for somewhere in the $2 billion range. They're, they're turning a profit, from what I can tell, Blackstone is, that is, by selling uh, this Vivint Solar, uh, the Vivint Solar aspect of Vivint, uh, buying it for $2.2 billion. And uh, I'm just looking at a quote here from my friend Julie Blunden, who used to be at SunPower, and she is now the Sun Edison Chief Strategy Officer, and she said, quote, we, we're just seeing the first of the renewables super majors, the first of the renewable super majors, and Sun Edison will be at the top, unquote. So it's a case of uh, major players in the energy industry who are looking for uh, uh, companies to acquire that will allow them to, uh, to be bigger and bolder and, uh, and make more money for themselves and their shareholders and so forth. Sun Edison is big. I mean, they're a publicly traded company. And they started, uh, they were started by, amongst others, my friend Jigger Shaw, 
Brian Robertson um, and Claire Broido Johnson a number of years ago. This was actually a Harvard MBA uh, idea to go into the third-party finance business, and, and the Sun Edison uh, were the uh, were the folks that started, and uh, they got involved in doing uh, third-party-owned system providing third-party owned systems for commercial and they've gone worldwide global and now they're they're doubling down or getting into uh, residential so Marco, we're, we're out of time i i guess okay. what i take out of uh, the whole deal is that it's a time for m a for mergers and acquisitions in the renewables yeah. world and it's yeah. a time for consolidation and big deals like this are going to happen more and more as you as you reported this is only the first of a number so we ought to be watching out on this seeing how it works on a national level. And I guess that includes seeing how it works with Nextera and Hawaiian Electric. Anyway, Marco Mangelsdorf, um, wonderful to talk to you as always. And from two, two weeks from now, we'll do it again, right? Promise me. Jay, if I only could, uh, no can on August 3rd, but I'm on for August uh, 17th. Okay, we'll schedule it for then. Thank you, Marco, as always. My great pleasure, Jay. Thank you very much. Aloha.